Good morning. For those of you who weren't here for uh, Sunday school, my name is Roy Nagelkirk. Uh, for, those of, uh, for those of you who were here for Sunday school, my name is still Roy Nagelkirk. Uh, I'm the son of uh, Bob and Helen Nagelkirk, who have been in this church for uh, not terribly long. I'm, the, uh, I'm the, the third of four children. The, uh, the fourth one is also here, my younger brother Russ which is a real privilege because he was here for Sunday school as well, and now he's here for the sermon. So this, will, this is the first, time he's here to, uh, the first time he's present to hear me speak. So this will give me the chance to tell him what I think for two hours, and he hasn't got anything to say back to me. So this will be a real treat. And uh, Anyways, uh, I'm here because uh, I, uh, I live in France normally. I'm part of a ministry called Greater Europe Mission. And my wife and I went to France about 12 years ago with the goal of sharing the gospel with North African Muslim immigrants who live in France. Uh, my wife Jennifer and I have five children, and uh, I'm here with my, my number two, Katrina. And we came to spend a couple of weeks with my folks, so that's why we're here. And uh, I told my dad, I said, well, if, uh, if they're open to having me come for Sunday school, I'd, I'd love to be able to share. That'd be great. And so Pastor Bud thought, well, that'd be great if he could get a week off because he knew ahead of time he'd have gallbladder trouble. And so he thought, well, if I could preach, that would be really wonderful. Then he could have the week off. So actually, God worked that all out. Uh, he was disappointed not to be here, but it, it really worked out. Again, God is provident, and he watches over us. So uh, this morning for Sunday school, if you were not here, uh, I shared a little bit about the ministry uh, I, I shared uh, to a certain degree about Islam, what is, it, what is Islam, what, is, what do Muslims think, uh, what is the basis for their beliefs. And I'll, I'll share a little bit uh, during this time as well, but because this is the message, uh, for me it's very important to share from the Word of God. Now, I don't believe in, in coming to church and not having some food from the Word of God. So uh, what I decided to do, and I've done this before, so you're not guinea pigs. I've practiced this on others. So if it sounds sloppy, then I'm really doing a bad job. But uh, what I'd like to do is I would like to take a look at a short psalm, Psalm 113. And it's very interesting in the psalm what we read. And it's a short psalm. But what I would like to do is I would, take, I would like to take this psalm, and we're going to look at it, and we're going to see a couple of things that God reveals about himself in this psalm. And we're going to compare what God's revealing about himself in this psalm to what Islam teaches about God. And we're going to see there's some things uh, that are, are very much in agreement between Islam and what the Bible teaches. And there are other things that are very much in disagreement. So we're going to take a look at the psalm, and, and we'll see how the time goes. I'm not preaching in French, so I'm just going to take my watch off. We're just going to have fun this morning, go for a long time. Just kidding. <laughs> I wouldn't do that to you. Um, we're going to take a look at this psalm and, uh, and, and compare then the word of God, what God is revealing about himself, and look at what Islam teaches, okay? And then maybe talk a little bit about ministry. This psalm, it's part of a group of psalms called the uh, Egyptian Halal, and this is because these, these psalms, Psalm 113, 114, several of these psalms right in that area were put together, and they were part of certain Jewish festivals, and particularly the Passover. And Psalm 113 was, doing, was used during the Seder service, during the Passover service. And so it's very, very likely, very probable, that Jesus sang this psalm with his disciples the night before he was betrayed. And it's a psalm of praise. We'll put up the... Uh, I'll use my... This is power here. This is just like the telecommand at home. You know, a guy's got to have his telecommand, his power... Telecommand, that's the French word. I'm sorry, what is it in English? <laughs> He's got to have his remote control. Okay, here's the first few verses of Psalm 113. Praise the Lord. Praise, O servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Let the name of the Lord be praised, both now and forevermore. From the rising of the sun to the place where it sets, the name of the Lord is to be praised. The Lord is exalted over all the nations, his glory above the heavens. Who is like the Lord our God, the one who sits enthroned on high? We're going to stop right there. Now, as you can see, it's a psalm of praise, and we were just doing that in some of our songs. And so that's the theme, and it starts out with that command. 
praise the Lord. What exactly does that mean? Praise the Lord. Why do we praise the Lord? Is God confused about how great he is? Or is that more for us? What does it mean to praise the Lord? Now, praise is something we actually practice all the time, right? What a great Ohio State team we have this year. What a great coach we have. Well, we'll see about the coach. We're not sure about that yet. We're going to find out. What a great car I bought. This car, I just bought this new car. This is the most incredible car. This thing is wonderful. Or that new big screen TV. Oh, you can watch movies on this big screen. Or my grandchildren. How about my granddaughter? Isn't she wonderful? She's just really wonderful. Praise is just a part of our everyday language. And it's basically just to say good things about something. Okay, I like my granddaughter. She's really cute. She probably is, and that's a good thing to say. But there's nothing in this world that deserves unlimited praise. I could stand up and praise my wife. I could go a long time, go on a long time about my wife. But I, could, I would get to a point where you'd all start getting glassy-eyed and think, okay, that's a little bit over the top. That's enough. Nobody deserves unlimited praise except God. But what does that mean to, to praise God, to say good things about God? Why do we do that? Why are we commanded to do that? There's some real blocks, some real blockages, some real, some real impediments to praising God. You know, we, we get very intellectual sometimes about God. We talk about theology, uh, election, baptism, uh, the filling of the Holy Spirit. Uh, we have certain subjects we talk about, theological subjects, and we can be very intellectual about God. And God is no longer personal. God is no longer present. Or on the other side, another, another danger is we're very traditional, ritualistic about God, especially if you've been in church a long time, if you've grown up in a Christian family. God is language. We, we talk about God, and you can know all the language. You know all the things to say. You know how to pray just right. You even know how to praise God, but it's very ritualistic and very much a part of a tradition. But that doesn't mean God is actually present and personal. What does it mean for you to praise God? Is it intellectual? Is it, is it just kind of the ritual you're, that's a part of your life over the years? Or is it very real? Is it very personal? What does it mean to praise God for you? Praise is, is really a state of mind. Look what he says. Let the name of the Lord be praised both now and forevermore from the rising of the sun to the place where it sets. And of course, we're dealing with poetry. Psalms are poetry. And the psalmist could have just said, praise God always everywhere. But that's kind of boring, right? So both now and forevermore, from the rising of the sun to the place where it sets. There's a beauty to what he's saying. But it's really about, is, is praise a state of mind for you? When I grew up, we had the little, we learned the little prayer for uh, mealtimes. God is good. God is great. Let us thank him for our food. How many learned that? I mean, okay, yeah. Okay, you, you know, and as a kid, you know, God is great. God is good. Let me add the peanut butter sandwich, okay? Uh, it becomes very much a ritual. But how often do we stop and think God is good? God is great. And God really is in the picture. And so praise is a state of mind that, that God is good, God is great, and God really is in the picture. And there should be a sense in which our life is just in that state of mind, that whatever happens, God is good. Wherever it happens, God is great, and God is in the picture. And so for even Bud this morning, he was very frustrated he couldn't be here. Is God still great? Is God still good? Is God still in the picture? So there's a sense in which that's a state of mind. That's a, state of, that's a way of just living life. But there's also a measured sense of that, that there are times where I need to stop and I need to think about God. Okay, where's my life right now today? And is God good? And is God great? 
and is God in the picture for me? I remember one time uh, I was just talking to someone this morning. He was asking about ministry in France. And to be honest with you, 70 to 80 percent of missionaries who go to France do not come back after their first term. There's not a lot of rewards, there's not a lot of fruit. It gets very frustrating. And I remember one time uh, I was very frustrated, I was very down, I was very feeling very defeated, and we had, a, we had a bunch of people coming over for a meal, and there was a sense in which I thought, what is the point? Why? Things are not moving, things are not happening. Why should I even bother? And I remember getting out, and I just thought, I have to go for a walk, I have to think. And, and I began to think of everything I was thankful for, just from the smallest thing to the biggest thing. And I just started going, and, I, and, it, and the list just kept going and going, and things just started to flow, and I kept thinking more and more about what God had given me. And the praise started coming, and that sense of darkness and the sense of being defeated and being down just lifted. And again, I was reminded, God is good, God is great, and God is in the picture. But I wasn't seeing it. And that's where praise comes in. God doesn't need praise. God knows he's great. God knows he's good. But it connects us back with the reality And so when I praise God, when I think about it, praise God, it brings me back to reality. That whatever is happening around me, God is good, God is great, and he's here. I like how he, the psalmist here, says the the Lord is exalted over all the nations. His glory is above the heavens. And and it just starts, starts rising up. Who is like the Lord our God, the one who sits enthroned on high, the one who has his place on high, and he lifts God up. And what we have here is we get to something what what the theologians call the transcendence of God. And it comes from the Latin word uh, trans and descendere. descendere. Okay, it means to, to climb beyond. And it's as if you're on a mountain, you're climbing, someone gets beyond you, you don't see them anymore. They're gone, they're, they're up, they've climbed beyond. And God is transcendent, Scripture teaches. God is beyond us. God is unknowable, unsearchable, incomprehensible. God is so big. God is so beyond us. God is beyond us. And we, we see his fingerprint. When we look around, we see reflections in things, in creation. But God, who, who can know God? We can be, that's why it's so easy to be intellectual or, or be ritualistic about it, because who can really know God? He's just so big. It's right at that point that the Muslim will say, Amen. God is transcendent. That's a primary aspect of what Muslims teach about God. God is great. God is the creator, the judge. God is unknowable. God is transcendent. God is beyond us. And the Muslims will freely talk about God, uh, about who God is, but God is transcendent. God is unknowable. God is way up high. And we have that in common. And as, as we, our families, we talk to Muslims, um, there's an aspect in which we're very much on the same level because we talk about the same God being great, being a great God. And that's one way, as I begin to share with someone, if I'm sharing with someone from a Muslim background, we'll talk about God, and I will talk about the greatness of God and how wonderful God is. And he will say, yes, God is very great. God is very powerful. We must praise the Lord. We talk about praising the Lord like the psalmist. The Muslim call to prayer, Allah Akbar. Every time they sing, Allah Akbar, God is great. A lot of their prayer is, God is great. That's what the prayer is, the Muslim prayer. It says other things, but a lot of it is just, God is great. And that's the meaning of the phrase, Allah Akbar. God is great. He's a great God. And so even in Islam, you, you have measured praise of God. That's why the prayer five times a day. So that five times a day you're called back to the idea that God is great. And so Muslims around the world, they live in the knowledge that there is a God and that God is great and that part of their lives, their lives revolve around that. It revolves around the prayer and the praise of God. God is great. And because 
God is great and we are small, we have to submit to him. So the word Islam means submission, and the word Muslim means one who submits to God. That's the very the real meaning of those words. We are to submit to God and to his will. And there's, very, there's something very good about that. There's something very right about that. God is great. Who is like, who is like our God? No one's like our God. Do we believe that? Do we understand that? Well, then, the psalmist goes on. And we have a shocking phrase. Who stoops down to look on the heavens and the earth. He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ashes. He seats them with princes, with the princes of their people. He settles the barren woman in her home as a happy mother of children. Praise the Lord. Right here, Psalm 113.6, we have what the theologians call the imminence of God. We have the transcendence of God. God is beyond us. We also have the imminence of God. That is, God stands by. It comes from the Latin again, God to be to stand by. God stands right by us. God is imminent. He is beyond us, but he's also imminent. He's right close by. We say God is good, God is great, and God is in the picture because he's right close by us. And he doesn't, he doesn't just stoop down. Look what the psalmist says he does. He raises the poor from the dust. So he, he, he comes down to look to see what's going on. And then he actually gets his hands dirty. He starts getting involved in lies. And it says, God raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap. And actually, I appreciate the translation, uh, the NIV translation of this, but this, there's a, a, a bit of a, it's a bit weak here because in the Hebrew it actually says he lifts the needy from the manure pile. The word is actually in the manure. That God actually, now I want you to picture this too, God actually lifts, he, he stoops down and then he picks up the needy from the manure pile. Now, what would happen if uh, you had just ordered some horse manure for the yard and the truck came and dumped a big pile of horse manure out in the front yard and you planned, you know, Saturday you were going to get out and you were going to spread that around, but, but your son, Jimmy, who's two years old, found it first. Okay? And he's climbing in it and playing with it and digging tunnels and you're going to have to go out there and get Jimmy out of the manure pile. And you go out and pick him up. What's on your hands? You've got manure on your hands. That's the picture the psalmist gives us, that God stoops down and pulls us out of the manure and then sets us up. It says, seats them with princes. doesn't just lift us up, but now lifts us up to where he is. He raises us, raises us up, and he gets his hands dirty with us. I can't tell you how strongly a Muslim would react to this picture. It's right at this point that he says, no, 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 no. That is not God. And this is where our roads diverge. This is where we separate. We can say God is great and God is mighty and incomprehensible, but at this point where God stoops down and gets involved in our lives and lifts us up out of the manure, it's at that point the Muslim says, absolutely not. This does not happen. This will not happen. This cannot happen. This is where we, we do not agree with each other. And it says even here, he settles the barren woman in, in her home as a happy mother of children. He gets involved with women. Now we talked in Sunday school a little bit about, unfortunately in Islam, there's not always a place for women. They're, they're about two ranks below a dog uh, in many situations. And here the psalmist, God comes down, and, and where is the place for the woman? The barren, the barren woman in the Jewish mind, now the, in the Jewish mindset, women definitely had a much higher place in the Jewish Old Testament mindset. It was a much more exalted place, but in every culture, a barren woman has a tough time. Even in our culture where motherhood is not really highly valued, children are not really high, highly valued, it's tough for women here not to have children. 
But imagine a culture where the very survival of the family, the survival of the clan depended on the woman. It was in her hands. The very survival of the nation was in her hands. And to be barren was to not play a part in that, not to play a part in the very survival of her people. And so it was very, it was very difficult. And so we have the story of Hannah, the mother of Samuel. And we have the story of Sarah, uh, Abraham's wife. And we have the story of uh, Elizabeth, who waited all her life, and then she had the greatest prophet that ever lived, John the Baptist. But God lifts up even the barren woman and gives her the highest place possible, a mother in her home with her children. And God involves himself in that level with us. And that's where we diverge from the Muslim who says that no, 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 there's no relationship between God and, and us. He is up there. And they, they picture it kind of like an ant having a relationship with us. You wouldn't imagine an ant having a relationship with us. And that's a bit how they picture the world, an ant having a relationship with us. We're, we're here, in the Muslim mind, we're here just to do his will. We're here to do the law. And so the Quran and other Muslim books are about doing God's will, doing the law, fulfilling the law, not even having your heart into it necessarily, just, just doing it. And we talked a little bit this morning. If you weren't here, I'm, I'm going to go over it a little bit. For those of you who are, who are here for Sunday school, I'll repeat a little bit. Because for those of you who weren't here, uh, there's 1.5 billion Muslims in the world. What do they think God does expect of them? Okay, well, what God expects is basically that they just do what they have to do. They do the will of God, which is the five pillars. We talked this morning about the five pillars. We talked about the confession. Uh, you confess... This is the confession, actually. I bear witness that there is no God but God, Allah, and Muhammad is his witness. And the minute a baby is born in the Muslim world, that is whispered into his ear. So from the very first moment a baby is born, they are spiritually bound because there's a binding that comes with every lie. And they're bound into this law. Okay, la ilaha ilaha Allah, Muhammad Rasul Allah. It's very poetic and sing-song. Uh, but this is the, the shahada, the, the uh, confession, and that's how a person becomes a Muslim. They say this in the presence of three witnesses, and they're a Muslim. Okay? The confession, they have five prayers a day, which is regulated by the clock, by the moon. And five times a day, they're expected to do their prayers, which are always the same prayer, said in the same way. It's very mechanical. And then they have the fast of Ramadan. Ramadan is one of the months, and again, it's a lunar calendar, like the Jewish calendar, so it, it's a little bit shorter than our calendar, the Gregorian calendar. So every year, Ramadan is a little bit earlier in the year, and this year, it's the month of August. It just happens to fall from the 1st of August through the 30th of August, and during that time, they're expected not to eat or drink from the rising of the sun to the setting of the sun. Now, what that means is, that doesn't mean they fast, it just means they change their eating hours. <laughs> so eating is during the night, and oftentimes the family will wake up 3 o'clock in the morning, the family gets up, has their big meal, uh, they'll rest, maybe go back to sleep, get up a little bit before sunrise, have another little meal, and then take off for work. So actually, more food is sold and eaten during Ramadan than any other time of year, so it's one of those things. <laughs> Um, it's also the time where the pastries come out, and there's these just wonderful pastries, and um, yeah, so we enjoy it, but uh, we don't fast. <laughs> um, anyways, there's the fast of Ramadan, and, and this is actually a very important time of year. This binds the family together. Uh, there's a suffering together. This is part of the reason their community is very strong. There's certain things they do regularly together that binds them together and makes it difficult for the gospel to penetrate, and it makes it difficult for those who convert to Jesus Christ to find their place because everything revolved around the prayers, Ramadan, and they find themselves lost oftentimes. Uh, it takes several years to figure out where do they, what do they do, how do they act, how do they react with their family. And this is something we deal with every year. So uh, there's the confession, the prayers, the fast of Ramadan. Then there's the pilgrimage to Mecca, that once in their lifetime, they're expected to go to Mecca and do a pilgrimage and see the Kaaba that supposedly Abraham and Ishmael built. And these things earn them points. And it's not unlike a lot of teaching in Catholicism where you have to believe, but you have to do a lot of good works, and your good works are a part of what saves you. 
And so in Islam, doing good works is what saves you. And the good works are the five pillars. Those are your good works. You need to do these things. You don't necessarily have to be a nice person, but you need to do these things. Uh, my Algerian friends, they complain sometimes that those who do the pilgrimage, uh, when they come back, they're actually worse and harder to deal with than they were before they went. Uh, part of that is because once they've gone to Mecca and they've come back, there's a sense of, okay, they've kind of accomplished that and they're in good shape spiritually and they don't need to be nice, they don't need to treat people with decency. They've done the Hajj, they've done the, the pilgrimage, and they're okay. And the last thing listed there is giving. They need to give a certain percentage of what they have. So these are what's called the five pillars of Islam. And Islam is about doing things. It's not about walking with a God who's present. It's not about being with a God who's personal, who reaches down, who actually wants to be involved in your life, who wants to do things with you and for you and in you. There's some pictures of the various positions of prayer. Prayer is not about walking personally with God and opening up your heart and sharing what's hurting you or thanking him or praising him. It's not about looking for comfort when you're lost and you're frustrated. It's about doing something and getting your points for it. Because God is not imminent. God is not close. Here's the Kaaba in Saudi Arabia, in Mecca. It's where millions every year come together. And they have a sense of unity. They have a sense of being together, doing something together. But it's not with a God who's close, who's present. I can be with God anytime I want. I don't have to go to Mecca. I can walk out my front door and actually be standing in the throne room of God. I can go in my room and close the door and lock it and get on my knees, and I'm with the king of the universe. I don't have to go to Mecca. One great difference then, maybe some of you have already jumped to that, if God is transcendent and God is not imminent, what is definitely not present in terms of the Muslim view? God does not incarnate. God does not take on flesh and walk among us and die on a cross. God does not come down and be with us in that way. And so Jesus could not be anything other than a prophet. And Jesus may be a prophet and a good prophet, but the Son of God is unacceptable. And so we have the truth of God and the word of God here, that God came down, he incarnated himself. And think of the people Jesus hung with in terms of lifting out of the manure. What kind of people did Jesus hang around with and got his hands dirty with and frequented and was criticized for? And so every time we do the Lord's Supper, we have this incredible picture of God coming down and being imminent with us, being right close by, actually walked with us and spoke with us. In Micah 6, 8, it says, uh, Oh man, what does God require of you but to love justice, love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God? And so he, there's no difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament in terms of what God is seeking is for us just to realize he's good, he's great, and he's in the picture. He walks close to us. We also have Philippians 2, 5 through 11, where it says a God in the form in the divine form, did not think it robbery to remain in that form, but he took on the form of a servant. He, he, he let go of his divine nature and took on the form of a servant. And he was obedient even unto death. And then we have the, the ultimate verse. Because we have to think about the practical side of this. Okay? We praise God. Uh, God is great. God is good. And God is present. But what's the practical side? Well, we have this promise in Romans 8.28. Who can say Romans 8.28 for me? We know that all things, that God works all things together for good for those who love him, who are called according to his purposes. For God works all things together for good. Now, the practical aspect of that is, as Paul said to the Philippians, he said, uh, do not be anxious for anything. But in all things, with thanksgiving, make your request known to God. Do not be anxious for anything. And so 
the practical aspect is our lives are completely different from the lives of other people because we know God is good. We know God is great. We know God is in the picture. He's present in everything that happens. And God works all things together for good for those who love him, who are called, called according to his purposes. So our lives are to be lives of praise where everything, everything comes under that umbrella. And God is always present. And then he asks us to go out and to share this. And I know that we're often held back by fear. We're often held back by what people will think of us. And we forget who we are. We forget what we've got. We forget that other people do not have this living presence of God in their lives, that God is good, he's great, and he's always present with us. This is the command Jesus gave us, to go into the nations, to make disciples of all people, to let them know about this. And that is our role as we, as we go to work, as we go wherever we are with the family, as we go shopping, this reality that wherever I go, my life is to be a life of praise, that wherever I go, I'm thinking in my head, God is good, God is great, and he's always with me. God is transcendent. He's transcendent, he's beyond us. He's powerful enough to take care of me. He's big enough to take care of me, but he's also imminent. He's close, he's good, and he wants to take care of me. He wants to do things for me, for his glory, for his honor. So why do I go to Muslims? Why would we go share with Muslims and teach them about Jesus Christ when converting Christianity means life can be really rough for them? Uh, in some countries, they can be killed for that. In other countries, thrown out of their homes. Even in France, I know many young women who, in coming to Christ, were beaten up by their older brothers. Why make life so miserable for someone? It's because without that other aspect, they know God exists, they know God is great, but without that understanding that knowledge that God is close by, God is in their lives, God wants to walk with them. Without that, all their good deeds mean nothing and count for nothing. And so that is the role that we play in coming to these people. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Jesus Christ, Son of God, Holy Spirit, we praise you. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, we praise you, triune God. Even saying that, triune God, what does that mean? How is that possible? It's beyond us. We can't understand that, Father. We don't understand how you are Father, Son, and Holy Spirit at the same time. It's beyond our understanding, and yet we know that you are close, that Jesus, you came, you took on flesh, and you walked among us. You're in our lives right now. Lord, I pray for those right now that are struggling with things. I pray for those who who are being tempted to doubt that you are good or who are being tempted to doubt that you are great or who have trouble seeing you in the picture, in, in their lives. And I pray, Lord God, that you would reveal to them right now that you are present, you are imminent, you are present with us, right here with us, alongside of us. As a matter of fact, we are temples of the Holy Spirit and if we are born again, we have you present inside of us speaking to us. And again, we don't understand all that that means, all that, how that works, how that's possible. It's beyond us. And yet scripture teaches us, your word teaches us, that you are this God who is beyond and above, but also close by, near, who cares for us, who lifts us up. And I pray for my brothers and sisters, I pray for Pastor Bud right now, that you would lift him up, that you'd heal him, that you'd put your hand on him, that you would touch him, that you would give him your grace, I pray for anyone else in this room right now, Lord, who's struggling, and I pray your Holy Spirit will comfort them, will guide them, will give them light, will encourage them. And I pray for us, Lord, that we would be a people of praise that whatever happens, wherever you are, in every circumstance, we know that you are good, you are great, and that you are present, and that you do work all things together for good. We don't always see what that looks like, Lord, but help us to trust in that and walk in that. And I pray for my brothers and sisters right here now, that they could walk in that, and their lives would be lives of praise, and that would change who they are, what they are, and where they go, and how they live. And I pray that you would bless this family of believers in the name of Jesus Christ, and we thank you for this time together. We bless you and thank you, and pray for this week, Lord, that through this week we would live lives of praise, and that you would be glorified in the way we live, how we act, how we talk. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. God bless you and keep you and cause his face to shine upon you and give you his grace.